Welcome everyone to the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research Think and Drink series of virtual talks. Uh, we hope that you are all as well and healthy as you could possibly be given the truly crazy state of the world. Uh, I'm Scott Hinkle. I'm the director of the Wyoming Institute for Humanities Research and it is my great joy to welcome you to our talk tonight. Tonight's conversation title is Economics of COVID-19. Is social distancing worth it? Uh, a topic about which there has been much debate and perhaps not all of it as well informed as we would like. So therefore, uh, hopefully we get some of that tonight. Uh, in a moment, I will introduce tonight's moderator, Dr. Ken Giro, uh, but a couple of technical notes first. For all of you who are here, if you want to press the button uh, on the upper left-hand part of your screen that says speaker view, then you will see just one, whoever's speaking at any given time, you'll see one big box of their video at a time. If you click that same button again and go to gallery view, then you'll see everybody uh, uh, who's a panelist at the same time, you may choose. Uh, also, there are two ways to send a question or a comment to the audience, and we hope you do that. Uh, down here, there is a uh, chat box. You can click the chat and you can send a message either to all the panelists only, or you can send a message to all the panelists and everyone who is in attendance. And you may also, down here, there's a Q&A box. If you choose to type a question or a comment into the Q&A box, that will come to just the panelists and the panelists only will see it. Uh, this summer, we're hosting these Think and Drink conversations every other week. Uh, so please join us two weeks from tonight. The topic two weeks from tonight will be race, protest, and democracy. If you want to keep in touch with us, you can send an email to humanities at uwyo.edu, and that will get you on our mailing list, and then you'll be kept informed of, of all the things that we're doing. Uh, after I uh, go off the screen, I will also type that into the chat. Just send a note to us uh, if you uh, want to keep in touch. Um, you can also see the recordings of all our past Think and Drink events if you go to our YouTube channel, which I will also put in the chat in just a second. Please help me welcome Dr. Ken Giroux, Professor of Statistics and member of the Humanities Research Institute Steering Committee, who will moderate our conversation tonight. Welcome, everyone. Thank you, Scott. It's called a think and drink, so if you have a drink, uh, feel free to sip from it. Um, <clears throat> it's my pleasure to introduce to you the panelists that we have this evening, and um, I'll just say a brief little thing about them and then ask them to tell something in particular about who they are before we launch. Uh, they are all three uh, economists on the faculty at the University of Wyoming. And they have been laterally studying um, on a societal sort of scale the uh, impacts of this pandemic. Um, and you'll hear more about them. But just to forewarn the three of you, what I'm about to ask you um, in about 30 seconds is a, a little story. How did you end up in Laramie? Okay, so just get, get ready for that. I didn't want to give you too much time to prepare because I, you know, I just want a little, <laughs> a little short story. Um, so all of you Lair Amigos out there and all of you out there Amigos, um, welcome to the Think and Drink. And uh, we'll start by having the three panelists just tell a little bit about themselves uh, in terms of their journey that brought them to this panel. And you, whoever wants to start can start. Um, I can go first. I'm at least first on my screen, uh, going from left to right. So uh, my name is Steve Newbold. I'm an assistant professor in the economics department at the University of Wyoming. Um, I'm a relatively recent transplant to Laramie from Washington, D.C., uh, Washington, D.C. area. I lived in D.C. for uh, not quite 20 years, uh, most of that time working as an economist um, at the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. And I came to Laramie two years ago. This is, I've completed two years of teaching at the university. Um, and mostly um, before uh, COVID-19, most of my research is focused on natural resource economics and environmental economics. 
Mm-hmm. Great. And um, yeah, my name is Linda. I am Swedish by origin. Um, and um, I came here just because of Jay that on my screen is right beneath me. And um, he, uh, well, we, we had a plan that we would be here for at least, you know, a couple of years. And then we were starting to think about, you know, where, where we would be. So I was here as a visiting professor for two years. And um, I completely fell in love with the department, with uh, Laramie, with Wyoming. And um, then, you know, really wanted to stay. So, and then then we had the opportunity to do so. There was a position for me as an assistant professor at the time. So here we are. And I would recommend everybody to come and visit Laramie and Wyoming. It's a pretty special place if you haven't been here. Don't travel now, but do it soon. (laughs) <laughs> well, and before we pass over to, to Jay, I just want to make a mention, Linda just achieved tenure just <laughs> past <laughs> few weeks, official notification yes. of that. So it's a milestone in any academic's life and uh, uh, hearty congratulations, Linda. It's a wonderful achievement. Thank you. <laughs> and last but not least. Hey, my name is Jay Shogren and I first came to Laramie as a grad student, <clears throat> got my PhD here and went away. And um, they hired me back. And so I came back to Wyoming from out east and have pretty much been here on with a couple trips. Spent a year in DC, spent a year in in, uh, Umeo and Stockholm and um, work on all sorts of well, I guess I work on, I'm a guy who's interested in lots of stuff and economics is one of it. And I'm interested in how the economy interacts with just about anything else that comes to mind. Health, human health, environmental health, conflicts, cooperation, choice under risk, um, institutional design, you kind of name it, I'm interested in it. Uh, so I, I'm, I seem to keep pretty busy. So what we'll do this evening um, is uh, I will pose questions to you. You, of course, uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, free to pose questions to each other if you want to follow up on something. Um, There will be questions coming in uh, eventually from the the audience. And I will, so if if during the course of this uh, conversation, I sound particularly um, articulate, educated, and intelligent, um, that's likely because I'm reciting a question from the audience, just, just to be clear <laughs> on that. Um, but I'll start with one that, that uh, I think is foundational um, to a conversation like this when you um, look at an economic analysis of, of something like this pandemic that we are already all understand in, a, in vague terms at least the idea that if we uh, shut down really harshly, we could stop the pandemic in its tracks, but it will have its own costs on, on the economic side of life and if we open up fully we'll pay prices so underneath all of that there's an implication that we can um, uh, I guess we can somehow put a, a, a dollar value on on human life can you guys that's a philosophical question that I think lots of people would struggle with conceptually um, maybe you, you guys can just open up on that one a little bit just to Get the conversation. Let me, let me jump in just with the big picture. First, we don't put a dollar value on human life. Everybody puts a dollar value on their own life. It's like having a body temperature. You know, when we stick a thermometer in your mouth, it's not, you don't have a temperature because we stuck the thermometer in your mouth. We're measuring 98.6 or 102. And the same with this value of statistical life. I mean, if we all valued our lives at infinite amounts, we'd never drive. We surely wouldn't drive in Wyoming. And we surely wouldn't drive in Wyoming in January, um, you know, to get to the airport or whatever. So we make these trade-offs all the time between risk and time, opportunity cost. And what economists attempt to do is extract that information from you, your trade-offs that you're willing to make on your own risk of mortality, life and limb, and how you uh, invest your time and your resources to try to minimize those risks 
or or not and so you know it's it's sometimes you know you think oh how can you put a value on life well we're not we're trying to uh extract it from people and because um budgets are constrained and uh, sometimes the choices that we confront are are pretty hard like um this one that we're considering now yep fair enough either steve or linda want to follow up on that um i can yeah i can just add to um put some more flesh on that in a sense uh, one of the main ways that we try to extract that information from people's choices is to look at um the association between wages paid in different jobs and the uh, fatality on the job fatality risks in, in those occupations so the idea is that people are free to accept or reject job offers um, and we assume people have a reasonable idea of how dangerous the job is before they accept the job and they know what wages they're going to be paid and so there's some amount of um, uh, choice people often have between different jobs with a higher on-the-job fatality risk but a higher pay or lower risk and lower pay and so observing how people select in and out of those jobs gives us an indication of how much people on average are willing to pay for um, reducing their mortality risk by a small amount and that's what the the value of statistical life VSL is 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 an estimate of and so those are the quantities that we use in um, benefit cost analysis like the one we did for, for this case. So just yeah. for the record, in any given question, you don't all three have to answer. So I'm not gonna yeah. insist okay. on that, but, okay. but I will say, Linda, do you have anything to add to that just now? Yeah, I, you know, I, I think, um, you know, this is one of the most controversial numbers that economists have come up with um, in terms of, you know, what is, how do we measure the value that people put on their lives? Um, but there are so many policy decisions where we need to weigh the risks against the benefits. So this is something that government agencies do all the time. They use, so, so you know, the standard number, which you know, Steve and Jay would know a lot about you know, since they've been working with these you know, government analysis, and especially Steve at the EPA, you know, is, is, is $10 million, that's what the government agencies would roughly, $10 million is what the government agencies use. Um, and that's how we conduct our benefit cost analysis, you know, and, and that's also, you know, so those are the numbers that you could also use um, when you're evaluating social distancing, you know, because we we're then weighing the benefits of saving lives against costs and to not make that an apples and oranges comparison you put a dollar value on the benefits of saving lives and then you need a dollar value on each life that you save once you have decided how many lives you're saving right so um so that is that that's the way that that number is used in benefit cost analysis we do have a, a question from the audience oh you want to add something steve yeah i was uh i was just gonna add something else i also saw Jay make a motion too. I don't want to jump in front of him, but um, uh, it's also important to understand that these are this ten million dollar figure is not for a um, it's it's not a um, value for avoiding certain death uh, to, to put it one way. This is this is sort of a scaled up number um, that should be understood as the total amount a large group of people would be willing to pay in the aggregate for each of them receiving a small reduction in their mortality risk in a year for example so if you know out of a hundred thousand people all of them have their mortality risk reduced by one in one hundred thousand in a time period um, and all together we would predict they'd be willing to pay in the aggregate um, ten million dollars because the expected number of um, uh deaths uh, that would be avoided uh, in that time period would be one so that's where the the nomenclature the the jargon value per statistical life comes from so in this in this um discussion already we've we've run into um 
behavior of individuals making choices, perhaps consciously, perhaps unconsciously, trading off risks and benefits. And we also have um, some kind of a summary and, and response to that in the aggregate. And, and Jay, there was a question that came up from the audience audience yeah, that you said uh, you want an answer would you jump well on that? there was two of two of them tim and and jane both asked you know how do we deal with this individual choices versus the collective the 10 million dollars is based on a whole series of individual choices and that um we attempt to uh use the Econometrics or statistics to tease out what these trade offs are based on looking at all this data. And it's really like you're a fire marshal going into a house after it's burned down. You know, you're, you're trying to find what, why it burned down, and you've got yourself a, your tools and you're shifting through the ashes trying to come up with some, some bigger picture on. How, how it burned, the intensity of it, everything. The same goes with this. We're looking at these trade-offs and we're trying to use the, the best statistical tools we have and understanding of behavior to pull out this information from all this data. And everybody's different. And so the 10 million really represents an average. Now it's, you can change, there's no one BSL. You can change it over uh, your age, you can change it over your risk preferences, you can change it over your ability to control risk yourself, you can change it over the dread, is it voluntary, is it involuntary? But to try to be able to come up with an individual number just even for the US of 350 plus million people, it's impossible and, and what has, it's come down to, um, the 10 million number is used by the EPA and by the US Department of Transportation. And it's actually used quite all around the world now to help evaluate these things, these different trade-offs that we face. So we understand that it's, that it's, a, it's an individual phenomenon. And one, one question was, well, how do you then look at, um, uh, you know, some sort of accident and how do you compensate people for that? Well, this is very different from that. that those are actuarial tables. Those are based on uh, money you thought you were going to earn. And that's the difference between economics and finance and economics and accounting and economics and insurance and all that is that finance and accounting and insurance are all dealing with wealth. And what economics is trying to understand is the well-being that's associated with the wealth. And so we're trying to get at another level, both economics is not all about business. It's not all about markets. It's about non-market trade-offs. It's about how we think about uh, the environment, how we think about the risks we face. It's a broader question that we're trying to answer, which is why the value of statistical life differs from say actuarial tables where I know how old you are, I know what job you're in, and I know how much money you expect to earn over the next 20 years. And if you're in an accident, I can compensate you for that loss. But that's wealth. And we're talking about understanding well-being and the trade-off that people make between money and well-being. Got it. So you mentioned the $10 million as, an, as a, a fuzzy average in a certain sense, and maybe that's exactly like temperature 98.6 well, your, Linda, your average, your, your temperature as a healthy person, of course, it fluctuates over the course of a day anyway, but your, your number might be 99 and mine might be 97 point. Individual values will differ from, from those. But let's, let's turn this into, um, uh, to, make, to focus it more specifically, I'm going to turn this question to you, Linda, first, just for the fun of it. Um, social distancing, how does, that, how does that how does that get factored into the conversation right now? We're paying a price for it. I know I am. We are all paying a price for it emotionally. Um, you know, Steve is listening to music right now because he, he <laughs> on his headphones. No, he's not. Um, <laughs> but we're paying a price for it, right? I mean, there's a personal price, well-being, which Jay mentioned. And uh, can you just start that conversation a little bit, Linda? Yeah. No, we are. I mean, there are, we, we know that there are 
large costs to, to social distancing. And um, you know, the, the, the reason we started this conversation um, to begin with was that, you know, we, so Jay and Steve and I and, and Dave Pinoff and, and Maddie Ashworth, who did a study um, where we looked at the costs and benefits of social distancing and if it was worth it from a social, um, social perspective. And, um, um, and when you, and, and the reason that we did that paper to begin with that study was because we observed that there are large costs to social distancing. It's, it was pretty obvious that it's going to save lives, right? So, so it has clear benefits, but unclear how large. Just that, you know, but there, at least to some degree, it's going to save lives. We know that, but we, we didn't know if, if those benefits would outweigh the, the substantial cost that, that we could imagine would be caused by the social distancing. And, and um, you know, it's, it's hard to put a price on emotions. Um, so, yes, we know that it's likely that some people are suffering emotionally from this. Some people might actually enjoy this time, right? So there might be others who are who emotionally benefit and think, you know, they slow down their pace of life and it's actually enjoyable to spend more time together and, and spend more time at home. Um, so, uh, but there are those costs and benefits that, you know, should be considered when we think about social distancing really, but they're hard to measure. We don't have a good grasp of, of what, what those, how to measure those or factor those emotions in, I guess, into a cost-benefit analysis uh, yet. Um, it's easier, but not easy at all, um, to, uh, to think about the economic costs. So what does this do to our economy? Um, and so if we, if we start there and, and you know, knowing that there are other costs, of course, also then associated with social distancing, but but if we start with just the economic costs and how it affects our businesses and economic activity, you know, we can make projections about um, how social distancing affects those things. Knowing too that if we did not social distance, business would not be as usual. You know, people self-protect, we would be scared, we would see hospitals overflowing with COVID-19 patients. We would social distance even if it wasn't mandated. Um, and, you know, so we need to think about or distinguish between sort of the, the mandated versus the individual um, social distancing. But yes, there are large costs associated with social distancing and there are also large benefits. Um, and what we found in our study was that the benefits, the social benefits from the life state outweigh those economic costs. Um, but then knowing that that type of analysis at this point is associated with a lot of uncertainties and you mentioned the emotional costs and benefits, and you know that should ideally be factored into that kind of analysis. And we're not there yet to be able to do that. Steve or Jay want to add to that? It was pretty much perfect, so I'm not sure what else you could say, but yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but, good, but go ahead, give it a shot. <laughs> well, we were, for whatever reason, um, we, Linda and I were sitting in the kitchen talking about whether it was taboo to say is it really worth it to have all this social distancing and and out of the blue i got a phone call from the new york times a reporter there who said um i have no idea if my facebook was on and it was somehow being monitored or what but she said how how do you think about um whether this is a taboo question, whether to not do social distancing or not. And the timing was quite odd. Um, so I said, well, we were just talking about it. And so then we went into the office and we asked Steve, who is uh, an expert at the integration of economics and epidemiology and trying to understand the feedback links between social and biomedical systems or social and ecological systems, the feedback loops go both ways and to understand how nature affects us and how we affect nature. And Dave Finoff, who's another uh, great modeler and Madison, Maddie Ashworth, who's a graduate student on this. And they had been working on a problem already of why don't people get vaccinated for um, measles? 
And that uh, that team had already been thinking about it, and we just said, well, we should really ask, try to ask the same question for COVID nineteen. And so, the model that we created was really a rapid response, since nobody else had attempted to do it. And so, as Linda laid out the broad parameters, we had some guide rails, which was which were not all that great. I mean, we had the evidence from the nineteen eighteen pandemic to sort of guide us on what it meant in terms of social distancing and recovery. We had a little bit of evidence from Goldman Sachs on what they thought COVID was gonna happen. Uh, we had some evidence on, um, from the government on this value statistical life. And we had some evidence based on influenza as to um, the infection rate and the likelihood of, of becoming infected once you're exposed to it. And our attempt was to put together as best we could, almost like a triage, what do we know about all this stuff? And, uh, and put it in a coherent framework so that if you don't agree with us, that's fine, give us a better number. If you don't uh, agree with X, Y, or Z, fine, give us A, B, C, let's try that. And the reason that this attempt at um, a rapid response attempt got a lot of press was because uh, nobody else was nobody else tried it. We sent the paper to science. Uh, they said, "Oh, these numbers are too risky." We sent the paper to PNAS. They had the same reaction. But yet people wanted these numbers because they wanted some clarity, some idea of where things were. And, um, and so uh, the ability to put a number on the table is, I mean, you got an infinite set of numbers, you probably are wrong. But to have at least a number on the table to start arguing about. Right. Really start a conversation. Start a conversation. Uh, you know, was I thought pretty useful for, for just general policy. Thank you. I'll move on to, um, you, you mentioned, um, Steve, I guess maybe this is related to your previous work or not, but uh, the epidemiology connection, um, obviously with the, the pandemic, we're dealing with an epidemiological phenomenon in a certain sense. Um, and how do you tie econometric thinking to uh, essentially what other people might think of as purely a medical, a medical situation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. Before I answer that, though, I wanted to ask Jay sure. to follow up based on what he said. Um, and this is kind of off topic, but uh, I'm just uh, curious, is the Facebook story, is that an accurate <laughs> account of what happened uh, with your Facebook story? We have all kind of, I'm just asking because in our household, we have all kind of folk tales about Facebook spying on us, and this would be the most egregious version of that I've ever heard. So yeah, well, I probably not. I I don't think so. But I I thought okay, the time right. was uh, <laughs> an incredible coincidence to be talking about it, drinking coffee, and then an hour later get a phone call from the New York Times. <laughs> so I was like, hmm, am I getting paranoid as I get older, or what is going on? Do you have Do you have Siri in your house? Yeah. Well, well yeah, yeah maybe. Maybe. Oh, also. <laughs> Maybe Siri was listening. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, I'm always listening, yeah. Um, so my question was about the epidemiological modeling. Yeah, at the, at the level we did this benefit cost analysis, um, the, the marriage between the two is um, uh, hopefully straightforward. Uh, there's a, we used a sort of textbook um, epidemiological model about uh, that describes how infectious disease spreads among people based on you know how many people have are infected at any given time and how many people are not and how um, how much people mix how, how many times people run into other people during the course of a day on average and with with those pieces of information you can um, calculate how many more infections you would expect to occur in the next time period. And so 
that's the ba outline of the basic epidemiological model that we used um, in this study. And there's, you know, we relied on uh, estimates from uh, epidemiological studies, um, not economic studies at all, but just uh, pure epidemiological studies based on in particular data from China in the early days of the outbreak there, um, experts were estimating how infectious the disease was based on how fast um, cases accumulated in, in Chinese cities. And so that's the kind of information we use to um, specify the parameters in our model here and other information um, from, for example, the effectiveness of social distancing measures in Sydney, I think it was, um, in an er earlier outbreak there. Um, and that gave us, uh, you know, sort of a benchmark value to let us um, estimate how many fewer interactions among people there would be uh, during the social distancing phase. And then the value of statistical life comes from those kind of studies I described earlier. So this is an exercise of putting together, you know, these sort of summary statistics from that are as closely related to our case as possible that we could get from previous studies into this simple model of um, disease spread that tells us how many people will be infected eventually before the outbreak sort of burns itself out. Um, and also with estimates of how uh, fatal the disease is if you get infected, what's the likelihood of not recovering, of dying before you recover. Um, so those are the main elements and those get put together in the, uh, the way you would expect. <laughs> um, and that, and that, that was the basis of our you know, predictions about how many infections there would be, how many deaths there would be without any controls or with these social distancing controls for the duration um, of the outbreak until hopefully a, a vaccine comes online um, after a, a year or more. So social distancing, is it worth it? Um, right now, it appears there are, there are experiments being run all around the world, aren't there? There's a, a, almost an infinity of experiments being run in the United States right now in terms of uh, different prevalence rates that happen to be there and then how people are responding to them. But New Zealand stands out currently as uh, remarkable. Is it just a, is that just that somebody's got to be doing best if you got a whole range of outcomes? Is there any attribution any of you might make in terms of, um, how they managed it, and I'm thinking social distancing is part of that. So is that just a, a statistical blip, so to speak? No, so when you're saying that New Zealand stands out, I'm assuming you're meaning that, you know, by not having any cases anymore? Correct. Right, yeah, so, and this is, this is when us economists sound so callous because we don't, I guess that's not our measure of success, right? We're looking at both the costs and the benefits if, um, so, a success to us is to maximize social benefits, and that doesn't necessarily mean having zero cases. It depends on the cost that you're paying to, yeah, um, to achieve that. Um, and I, I, you know, Steve or Jay might have better information on that, but I have not. That. I, I don't know what 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 that might look like for New Zealand. Um, well, but New, Zealand was, New Zealand was very aggressive in mm -hmm. their social distancing and took it seriously and, um, and really pushed it hard and pushed it early. Mm -hmm. And you know, they, as a politician, you run the risk of overreacting and you know, it's like all those hurricane warnings that never transpire, right? And everybody's boarded up their house and the hurricane went 200 miles up the coast. You know, you're like, oh, well, I'm glad I did that, sort of. And same with, uh, same with this. I mean, if you just had a clamp down and that is what everyone recommended, it's just... Um, certainly harder to enforce and you know. well and as, as linda mentioned that it was a success from that point of view of mm -hmm. um minimizing 
reducing perhaps to zero the number of current cases, but it, but it, it comes at a cost that it's harder to get a grip on um, mm -hmm. of uh, impact on emotional impact, I suppose, on well-being impact on individual lives. Um, factoring sure. that is. And yeah, no, costs. there's all those emotional costs of being locked in and all the more than emotional costs. I mean, physical abuse, uh, potential isolation, suicide, all the different aspects that go along with it that we have not included in our sure. estimates of the costs at all. The costs we're looking at is our, our financial, their GDP, gross domestic product, price times quantity on things that we buy. And we are not attempting, or we did not attempt to, but you could speculate to say, well, okay, here's GDP, we're losing 6%. Uh, the, are the emotional costs double that, triple that? What does that imply? You can run that kind of sensitivity analysis to say, then, uh, yeah, the social benefits weren't with it, but or weren't worth it. Social distancing benefits weren't worth it, given um, that the emotional costs were triple any market impact. Mm -hmm. But so you could roughly sketch it out, but to actually measure it, yeah, it would be rough. And it's also, I think, important to to know that you know, if you if you do an analysis of this kind, the one that we did, and we found that social distancing um, is worth it, um, it doesn't mean that it's worth it for everybody uh, at all. I mean, it just means that it's worth it on average or on aggregate. Um, and and then there are going to be a whole lot of people out there. If we do the individual cost benefit analysis for them, it's not going to be worth it. If you're in your 20s and you're healthy and you know you lost your job, but you're not at risk, and none of your family members are at risk from, of you know the disease or dying from the disease, um, you know your individual and um, trade-offs are going to look very different. And you know, so you we sort of imagine you know you see all these people that you might think of as crazies, you know, who shout for you know opening up the economy very quickly. Um, I mean, for them, that might make sense uh, because they might be in that category for which actually their individual cost is higher than the benefit of social distancing. So it's really important when, you know, to remember when you do these kinds of analysis too, that we're, we're all in it together. You know, those of us who, who are, you know, not bearing the burden as much, we need to help out the other ones who are uh, because on aggregate, we're better off. Um, but but it's important then to sort of compensate, spread the burden um, in society. I'm seeing that locally, at least, of course, I can only, I live my life in Albany County and Laramie in particular, um, but I'm seeing more uh, generosity and, and uh, goodwill and compassion, I guess, shown by our community to those who need that kind of help. So mm -hmm. maybe that's a, maybe that's a good thing as well. Yeah. Steve, you're, I can see you're sitting there thinking. You, you have something to jump in with here? <laughs> well, I was thinking about, I mean, you asked about New Zealand um, initially, and I don't, you know, we didn't run a, a version of our benefit cost analysis for New Zealand, so I, um, I can only speculate, but it has, you know, it has some things going for it. It's a small uh, island nation, yes. and so it's easier to, um, sort of limit um, movement in and out, that's an important aspect. People have uh, travel, international travel has been cut way down um, in and out of the US, but has not been um, stopped altogether, uh, my understanding is. And, and so it is possible to, you know, if you can cut off all movement in and out, and even if you had, a, you know, you have a few known cases, um, a, sh a short, in principle, a short, intense period of distancing. Everyone just stays put for long, long enough for those cases to resolve and not spread. Then you're done, and you can have no more cases as long as you let no more in. And so, if any, you know, country can pull that strategy off, New Zealand might, you know, might be one of those countries. Sure. Yeah. The island geography is a, a factor yeah. there. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anybody else with a comment on this right now, or shall we move along? Well, John had a question about how do you separate the noise from all these different macroeconomic impacts that are going on while we're trying to estimate it. And I guess 
um, part of the part of the modeling is to assume that you have a baseline where those macro other macro events are happening the rest of the world is going on and you have a policy where you're assuming that the same macro events are happening so they net each other out and what you're trying to look at is that one you're holding n minus one things constant and changing the n now that's what we assume that's how we handle it now of course there probably is some correlation between events and especially we're going to find out if there's going to be a big correlation between all the protesting and and covid all these different uh, uh ex chances <coughs> excuse me to be exposed and um so even though the protest is uh you know, happening both at the baseline and at the policy, the actual policy might influence it. So we're throwing noise back into the picture, um, no doubt. And then the question is, all right, how do you handle that? And that's again, going back to the sensitivity analysis, which is a way to cover our behinds by saying, okay, well, we don't know. So let's speculate 10% above, 10% below, and let's see how big this range really is. And if it's minus infinity to infinity, well, we haven't really added any information. But you know, if if the um, if the variance associated with with what we're doing is not too bad, then at least again we have all direction. Yeah, we have. We might not have the intensity perfect, but we have comparative static direction that things are moving. So. so the protests are, um, uh, it's quite possible in areas, especially where the prevalence is higher, that the, all that close quarters and protests and people projecting by ch shouting or singing is, is a, a, an enhanced risk factor. And I suppose that also will vary across the country in terms of places, like uh, in places where the prevalence is, underlying prevalence is low, it might not change things much. And, New York City or other places where the prevalence is high, it might cause a, a bit of a blow up. That sort of a, but I, I guess we're, we're seeing there though, the individuals making um, not a calculation per se, but they, their own cost benefit analysis as this issue is so important, I'm going to go anyway. Yeah. And um, that's, that, that's a manifestation of the individual and the individual ones are all over the map, of course. Mm -hmm. um, Linda, do you want to comment on that? No, I think that's right. And I, I think, you know, for a lot of people, you know, the, with the protests, I think we see that a lot in our community, you know, who took social distancing very seriously and, and uh, we're thinking about, you know, that that is that's something that we should do for ourselves or for our community or so on, you know, are now out protesting because, as you said, that issue is so important that... Um, the cost of socially distancing increases tremendously um, by not, um, you know, being out and, and showing our support for, um, you know, the, the, the incredible movement that we, that we have currently, you know, so it, that changes the cost benefit analysis. It was something that was not there before. Well, you know, we know it's been there for a while, but, but the, the protests weren't there before. So, so yeah. Um, it also maybe part, I don't know if part of the, um, the individual's question is about whether or not um, the protests would have occurred or would have occurred in the same, oh. with the same um, intensity and mm -hmm. been as widespread without, um, without the epidemic in the U.S. I mean, is, it, is that one of the things that would have been... <laughs> sort of the same without the um, outbreak as with. I am not sure that's the case, but I don't know what Linda and Jay think about that. Oh. It's easy to imagine rationally that the pandemic would, would uh, ought to reduce the uh, intensity of the protests. But on the other hand, we've all been locked down for three yeah. months or something. And uh, there's that human yeah. urge to connect. Um, A lot of people are and, idle and we're also seeing there's also a, you know, more, the more we learn about the incidents, the more it appears that um, 
people of color are hit harder, you know, are having worse cases, um, being hit harder by COVID-19 than, than sure, otherwise. That and so that exposes, you know, there's this, all this discussion about exposing more widespread systematic racism um, yep. than people fully appreciated before. So that, you know, heightens tensions. Yeah, it can feed the, feed the enthusiasm. This is for your next two, two, a panel two weeks yeah. from now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's out of my, yes, it's out of my area. area. Yeah. 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 I'm looking forward to that one, Frederick. Will be, another one of our board members will be moderating that one. And, uh, so, the, so in some sense, um, uh, something you, you didn't say explicitly, but I will throw it out to see if, if it stands up on its own, is that in some sense, we are all uh, micro scale econometricians or statisticians. Uh, because we're constantly implicitly doing that balance game in every choice we make, right? Do I drive to Cheyenne today? You know, a storm coming or, you know, all that. We're always constantly um, mm. making those decisions and our, our, um, uh, our appreciation of what the costs and benefits are might change it with our age, with, and like right now with the pandemic and social distancing, if you, who you have in your household, uh, an elderly parent or somebody in the household who's, who has underlying conditions that, they're healthy and fine now, but the COVID could be disastrous. That will change your own personal mm -hmm. uh, calculus on everything. Um, yeah. And I guess, then I guess what you're doing as econometricians is looking at, uh, I guess you tended to prefer, Linda, the phrase of working in the aggregate. I like that somehow better than on average. Mm -hmm. Because it, it, has a, it has a different um, interpretation in my mind. Hmm. Jay, you're nodding. Are you trying to nod wisely or are you nodding off? Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm nodding wisely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this question about what people would, would have done otherwise, I think, is an important one. Um, you know, we had um, a lot of sort of restrictions imposed or recommended, strongly encouraged, um, schools closed, you know, uh, parents didn't have a big say in that, in that uh, choice. So a lot of decisions were made for us. Um, and so a, an important unknown here is what would have happened had none of those sort of um, top-down restrictions been imposed and people were left to their own devices to decide how risky they thought it was mm -hmm. based on how many cases they saw occurring um, in their region or elsewhere in the country. That's um, really to do a, you know, a, a perfectly accurate benefit cost analysis, we would like to know what that outcome would have been to compare, um, you know, the outcome with the extra externally imposed. So all we, all we need is a parallel universe, you're saying, and we can, yeah, right. so, yeah no problem. <laughs> well, we'll get right on it. I mean, so, this, this, I mean, the, the pandemic is like climate change, uh, one of the world's great biggest coordination games ever and a coordination game if if you remember is uh, the mutually assured destruction between the u.s and the ussr right that um we had to coordinate there's two equilibriums mutually assured destruction and peace and you hope to coordinate your actions so you both fall in the peace category and the same goes with uh the pandemic you know the same if um, we all coordinate and choose to stay home or we all coordinate and choose to wear masks or we all choose to coordinate and wash our hands uh, or we choose to do all three or we choose not to do all three or some fraction of it, um, it's really going to impact the risks. And um, you know, if, if you're a student of game theory, this is, um, this is one of the biggest, it's not a prisoner's dilemma, it's a coordination game. And uh, trying to figure out ways, behavioral ways to get people to focus in on doing what is the best equilibrium for all. You know, the John, avoiding the uh, Nash, John Nash equilibrium of, yeah. you know, uh, the race to the bottom <laughs> is pretty hard. And, you know, part of, uh, part of the other work that this team has been doing that Linda has been spearheading has been looking at the behavioral reactions about whether people will 
uh, take a test, whether they'll get a vaccine if they actually exist, and how they just react to the risk of this sort of low probability, high severity event. And that's, that was a whole other side of, of the work that we haven't touched on tonight that is more based on you know, talking to people, survey work. Yeah, the, um, all three of you have touched on the, um, the ineffable, you just can't, the cryptic, I don't know what, what the mysterious uh, element that is our human emotions that mm -hmm. come into play. And I think my own view on that is that we are all, are all it's not my own unique view, but uh, he, he, emotional creatures at base. And, and uh, by the time a thought has risen to consciousness, it's too late. You've already made your decision. <laughs> And attempts to rationalize it are just right. We don't say rational. We say rationalize. We don't call it rational. I, mm -hmm. I think. But but I'm, what I'm thinking here is what I lead into is um, you know a few weeks ago we had a graduation weekend at, for the university and and there were kids who came into town for that because they wanted to see their friends and the the four years of I'll say beginning adulthood that represents an undergraduate four or five or six years depending on how long you take. Um, there's a sense, of course, at graduation weekend that you might not see some of those people ever again. Um, that sense might have been unconsciously heightened by the pandemic. Um, and our need for connectivity, again, it's not a thought out process, but our need for connectivity, of course, there's going to be people hugging and, and shaking hands. And, and I think that's not to be decried, per se. That's mm -hmm. in part essence, the essence of who we are what we are as creatures on the planet. Mm -hmm. Comments on that from your perspective? Well, that was quick. Yeah. <laughs> no, it's, it's one of, um, this is not, the, the sort of behavioral aspects are not my area either, but it, it does strike me that, yeah, and I've heard people talk about this, sort of the, one of the um, tra tragic aspects of this particular crisis is it's, um, it's not like some previous ones where we could cope partly by gathering together and taking comfort in each other's company, company and, um, you know, sort of supporting each other uh, emotionally by being close. Um, this is a case where we have to stay uh, separate to, to be as safe as possible. So that makes it uh, harder in that way than, than other, other cases. Mm -hmm. And emotions are very important to our well-being. I mean, as economists, again, we're, we're focused on the well-being of people, of nations, and, and that's what we want to maximize. And, and um, you know, you, you, it, they're hard to measure. The value of emotions um, are, are hard to measure, but, but that doesn't mean that they're not important. I mean, they're incredibly important to, uh, to our well-being. So... Um, yeah, I think that's a very good point, um, and that that you know we we should we should consider that if we can. And I I would be surprised if there aren't people out there currently too who are trying to you know get to um, the. I mean, I know that there are studies out there that are looking at suicide rates and and depression and you know that could have been triggered by social distancing, um, but we don't have to go to those more extreme emotions, you know, that there there are degrees of of emotions where it's still bearable, um, but it just harms us. Um, that that we could imagine that we we should measure, but yeah. Okay, yeah. you're trying to stop yourself from talking there. Hand over. Your... Looking wise again. That's all. <laughs> Steve. I was just going to say, I mean, yeah, this is not something that's really that cost benefit analysis does well. I mean, but there is an in, in principle answer to this that um, the, the way you would like to put that in a benefit cost analysis ideally is to, for example, ask people if you could ask people after the fact, after they've been through this experience, um, if you can get an, a, a reliable answer to the question of how much would you have been willing to pay to avoid all that heartache you just went through for the last so many months? What's the, what's the maximum um, amount you'd be willing to pay to avoid that? How much money would, 
would you have to have given up uh, X ante before it happened to be just as well off with that, you know, lower income as you were um, after going through this ordeal? Yeah. Yeah. That that quantity of money is is the the quantity we'd like to put in the benefit cost analysis, right. and and including a, the value of everything they lost, yeah. including their emotional distress. As an audience member noted earlier, money can't buy me love. Um, so yeah. it's, a difficult, yeah. it's a difficult transition yeah. from, from that w one world to the other. Right. Yeah. But it's interesting, you, you, um, I, I, I guess I want to go back a little bit to, to Jay's point about the coordination game too. So not only are the cost benefit analysis going to differ you know, across individuals, but they also differ across countries. So there is a group out there um, by Bjorn, with Bjorn Lundberg and, and a few other researchers that are working for governments of developing countries and looking at their cost benefit analysis of um, social distancing. And it turns out that their trade offs are way different from ours. Of course, their healthcare systems are different. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the um, importance of face to face education is much. You know, it's much greater because you don't have access to online education from home. Um, there are other diseases that are affected by social distancing. Air quality is bad indoors, for, you know, more so than outdoors, and and so on. You know, so there are very different trade-offs for those countries. And then, you know, if, if we're going to socially distance well, not only should we coordinate it within countries, but you know, we we should also coordinate it across countries if people eventually are gonna start traveling again and we haven't developed herd immunity, say, you know, and then we get an influx again of the virus um, from countries who might not have socially distanced to the same extent um, as well. So, so it's, it's, um, it's an interesting coordination game on a, on a global scale. Yeah, sure, sure. Any other rising comments or we'll move on? Well, I'm, the one comment from Tim is uh, the willingness to accept governmental constraints different too across people. Obviously, yeah. I know a lot of musicians and some of them are putting on a mask as tyranny. Mm -hmm. and, um, and I thought it was common sense, you know, not, not an affront to the, the constitution. Mm -hmm. And I mean, no shirt, no shoes, no service, no mask, no service. What's the difference? You know, you're not crying about having a shirt on or shoes on. Why are we crying about having a mask on? Uh, but they're right there. Talk about a coordination issue on something that seems obvious to some people and something that seems total um, control to other people, governmental control to other people. It... Um, uh, it makes it pretty near impossible to find uh, something to coordinate on. Right, and and as an example, in the opposite direction, a friend of mine um, was trying to shop uh, to yesterday or today in Denver and was asked to leave the shop because he was wearing a mask. Oh, interesting. And the shop owner said, "Out." Oh. Wow. So there's. There are there are strongly held views that are yeah. on either end of that spectrum. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. But coordination requires, you know, coordination. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you don't coordinate, the the thing starts to unravel. And so, we'll see if this these experiments you talked about everywhere around the world. We'll see if this second wave is, uh, you know, an inch or a, or a tsunami. I guess we're going to find out. Yeah. And definitely, I think the, um, the uh, emphasis in this country on uh, individual uh, freedom and indiv individual rights, which is not quite the same, held to the same degree in, uh, I'm from Canada, New Zealand, uh, other countries that are part of the British system. Um, there's a little bit more of a sense of, of uh, um, well, the, the, the individual is not so uh, uppermost you're willing to give in a little more for the sake of the community in here. Um, maybe that explains to some extent the, the lack of coordination that's here, but that in itself is another experiment. Mm -hmm. People are each acting under their own 
what they think is their own best interest at the moment. And, and there's not a strong, would you say that in this country, there's not a strong collective sense of coordination, I guess, to use your term? Depends on what we're coordinating over. You know, I mean, after 9-11, there was strong coordination that we needed to do something somewhere. And there wasn't 100%, but, you know, there was that sense of coordination. Um, on this, there was a sense of confusion more than coordination here in the U.S. Seems in New Zealand, there was a sense of coordination there. And, um, you know, but you can react differently saying, well, that was top down, heavy handed versus uh, people really coordinating. They were just told what to do. Same in South Korea. Interesting. Yeah, and it's, I mean, there are studies that I've looked at now too. You know, it matters what news channel you're paying attention to. So there is, of course, this, you know, big wave of, of research. It's, it's quite phenomenal how the research community has come together to study this crisis, different aspects they're, of it. They're coordinating, you're saying? Yeah, oh, yeah, exactly, exactly, they're coordinating. And it matters, you know, your, your beliefs, of course, about how dangerous the disease might be and, um, you know, whether, whether or not you perceive wearing a mask as, as the government just trying to control you um, and so on. I mean, all that is going to matter to how you're going to respond to the pandemic. And, um, and there are studies that, you know, have recently come out that are showing that what news channel we pay attention to, what politician we're paying attention to, um, matters to the amount of, um, the amount of self-protection we're undertaking and also how we perceive the risks. So we, that, that shapes our beliefs. Yeah, here's a, I, I thought a good question since we're, we're reaching close-ish to the end of our time together this evening. Um, where might you want to go next? Not physically, geographically, but as uh, econometricians, what are the things that would, uh, interesting, what questions might interest you for investigating now? It, and maybe some of them can be fantasy, meaning if we could, but um, I'd be interested in hearing your thoughts um, on that question. Oh, I could go first if uh, Linda wants to think about. I, I want to. The thing I'm interested in most next is that um, the testing strategy. Uh, I mean, a lot of uh, some prominent people have promoted testing and uh, tracing, contact tracing, and sort of you know targeted self isolation of people who find out that they have an infection as a complement or substitute possibly entirely substitute for the social distancing approach. Um, I mean, in principle, you can imagine if, if it were possible, if it were easy enough to test everyone, you know, in real time, continuously, right? And people could look- I did say fantasy. Learn. Yeah, yeah, so that, that's, the, that's the fantasy example is if you could just know when you were infected at any instant, right? As soon as you're infected, you knew it. And if, um, everyone could coordinate on the strategy of once you know you're infected, then you go home for, or, or get care for the duration of your infection and, and take as much care as possible not to infect anyone else. That could rapidly extinguish an outbreak, right? So then sure. the question is more realistically, um, how rapidly can we test people? Um, and how accurate are the tests? How, how much would it cost to test people fast enough to um, sort of approach uh, uh, an outcome where you could get a, a good control of an outbreak pretty quickly, with just a testing strategy and not have to do this broad-based generic social distancing approach. So, um, and people have, you know, there's a lot of people working on that, um, but that seems, that's one thing I'm interested in spending more Steve's, time on next. Steve's fantasy, Linda? Yeah, I would, I would love to get at what you were talking about before. I mean, being a behavioral economist, I, I, um, I'm very interested in, in um, you know, how, how people might differ in their approach, and some, sometimes it's rational and sometimes it's not, um, to, to these kinds of pandemics, and, and, um, so, and getting at 
how that is driven by emotions and beliefs, um, I would be very interested in. Um, so, and but my main dream scenario would be to have numbers with no uncertainty whatsoever about <laughs> you know, the benefits and the costs and different scenarios, different degrees of social distancing, like should we shut down schools versus not, um, you know, and, and could we have different degrees of social distancing across the country? Um, could certain states like Wyoming, could we get away with having less of social distancing, maybe keeping our schools open? but you know, maybe the university would need to be shut down or the opposite or you know, that all those nuances and have perfectly certain numbers on that, that would be my fantasy world. So everything has a cost and a benefit and uh, you just fantasize right now about the benefit of having perfect information, but I'll point out that if we did, that would put you three economists and one statistician out of work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So be careful what you wish for, Linda. Jay, yeah. any <laughs> thoughts there? What What would interest you next? Uh, yeah, I, I don't. I don't know. I'm interested in. I'm interested in how people have reacted to um, staying home and the unraveling of these networks and how quickly they'll reestablish themselves. And um, I, I, you know, I've been on the road for 40 years. And so for me staying home for the last three months, it's been great. Um, but I seem to be in the minority on this. And uh, so I'm interested really in you know, the big thing about economics is creating value through exchange, right? Me and you have different things. We trade them. You get what you want. I get what I want. We create value. And we've really changed how we create value during this short time period um, where the billionaires are becoming trillionaires because they're able to deliver things in a safe way. Uh, and so I'm real curious as to once we start rolling things out, if we'll just go back to the way we were, or if uh, there will be some permanent structural change in, um, in how we decide how these networks actually work. Here's a, not a fantasy question, but it is um, a future prediction, I suppose. And prediction's difficult unless you already know the answer. Um, <laughs> but but how would you, do you see the, um, what do you see as a potential disaster waiting for us in different parts of the country, I suppose, differentially in different parts of the country for a second wave? Um, there are states that opened up earlier than, than say we did here in, in Albany County. Um, and now some of those states are seeing a rather alarming surge in cases and they're thinking of shutting back down again. Mm -hmm. Where do you see that seesaw playing out? Of course, it's going to be in the aggregate from your analytic perspective. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, you know, we, we were banning folks from Colorado to come up here and camp, right? We were asking no Coloradans to sp spend the night. And over the last 50, 60 years, we pushed towards globalization of let people do what they do best where they have the lowest opportunity cost and just specialize and generate and create uh, things. And so when Trump was elected and started putting on tariffs and trade restrictions, 99.9% .9 of all economists said this is insane because this is how we create value through trade. This is how we destroy value by putting all these tariffs on. But once you add, um, you know, spillover effects in a negative fashion with, with, oh, there's Artie with her chew toy. Um, you can hear the squeaking. Um, so what, by the way, we have a tradition of having dogs uh, <laughs> Zoom bomb, Zoom bomber. Yeah, well, that was Artie Zoom bombing with her squeaky chew toy. Um, Perfect, okay. Once we, you know, once we decide that trade is bringing all these externalities with it, all this different risk, um, 
then all of a sudden tariffs make more sense. Wyoming should put a tariff on, uh, you know, visitors from North Carolina if, if we think that the risk is higher. You know, if, if North Carolina or Arizona, they're also peaking. Texas is beginning to, to accelerate as well. So should we put a tariff on all the visitors who come to Wyoming and put a tax on so to pay for, um, to pay for, you know, better hygiene, better cleaning products? You know, it's really going to reverse how we think about tourists and how we think about trade and the whole economics profession from Adam Smith on has been based on this idea of trade is good, it creates value. Until now, it don't. Now it's looking bad. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our allotted time. That's one point. A second point is it's called a think and drink and my glass is empty. <laughs> no drink, no think. Um, so I, maybe I'll ask you each if you have any a little short wrap-up comment to uh, conclude the, the evening's conversation and we'll, uh, we'll wrap it up and bring Scott back into the, into the picture. Anything you'd like, brief comment to the gathered attendees? Well, well you can say goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> say it in Swedish. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> I guess I'd say thanks for coming and, and hopefully at the end of the day, um, you recognize that economists are really more like applied philosophers rather than finance people. Um, you know, we, we, we deal with markets, non-markets, emotions, rationality, and the whole sole goal is to try to frame a problem so that people who have to make hard decisions have some information that gives them some guide rails where they're going to end up who knows and whether our advice is worth it um, is another story but i mean there is a reason in the u.s inside the white house there is the council of economic advisors because that's our sole job is to try to provide that rationale not tell them what to do but try to set up some guidelines um, sometimes it helps Sometimes it doesn't. Linda, Steve. I thought that was a very good wrap up by Jay. <laughs> you probably wrote it for him ahead of time, but never mind. I did, I did. It was perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, any parting comment? No, just thanks for having me. Um, thanks for doing this. This has been fun. And Jay, let me uh, let me know. Um, when the New York Times calls next and what was going on in your <laughs> over your breakfast table at that time. <laughs> we need to know if you had on that. We need to know if you had Siri on. So thanks again to the three of you for taking the time this evening to join us in this conversation and uh, out there, all of you Laramigos and out there amigos, uh, thank you for joining us and uh, have a pleasant evening everybody.